So this this is a joint effort. Andrew and I will go through the various aspects of health economics, um, and there's some exercises for you to to do um, before break time. Um, but first of all, I've got some slides that I've put together, which consider health economics and where all this stems from, and why should we and do we consider health economics in decisions concerning the availability of medicines, both from a formal perspective, but also from a national perspective, and the work perhaps that the National Institutes for Health and Care Excellence and other such organisations, such as the SMC, obviously here in Scotland, um, do on a, on a routine basis in terms of assessing cost effectiveness of medicines. So the context really is this balance of supply and demand. On the one side, we have demand for health, um, which arguably is infinite. Everybody wants to be in a good quality of life as possible and live for as long as possible. Um, the demand for health care is a derived demand. Um, it's a demand which um, results on the basis that people want an improvement in health, and the way to achieve that is through accessing health care. And so pressures placed on the health care system um, are increasing. They've always increased. I think the original starting point um, 70 years ago with the NHS being founded was the fact that it would meet all the demand placed on the healthcare system and things were kind of stabilised. But clearly that isn't the case. Um, demand continues to increase. And it's for a number of reasons. I've got some slides which I'll go into some of these in more detail in a moment. On the other hand, we have the issue of, of resources and how do you finance um, healthcare and how can you meet the demands? And, and this is clearly very challenging. There's a political issue and a dimension to this. It's not just in terms of money and scarcity of money, but it's other forms of resources, such as hospitals, um, such as doctors, and training healthcare professionals um, with things that can't be done overnight. And there's national shortages in these. And one way in which um, supply um, exceeds, sorry, supply doesn't meet demand is manifest in the UK by extended waiting lists. Um, in the USA, for instance, um, the, the rationing mechanism is through, uh, through payments, whether it's through insurance or through out-of-pocket payments. If you can't afford it, you don't get it. In the UK, that manifests in terms of waiting longer for your, uh, for your treatment or for your surgery or whatever your intervention that's required. Also, um, the non-availability of new expensive treatments. So in ever, in, invariably, choices um, need to be made to determine which interventions, which packages of healthcare ought to be reimbursed by the NHS. And ideally, they would be the most valuable components of healthcare. And which things um, are not considered good value for money, and so are not good investment in terms of <coughs> obtaining um, health improvements. So simple choices, seemingly simple choices, but which are technically and actually very difficult to make, would be whether to invest in an expensive new treatment which has marginal improvements in health outcomes um, versus perhaps a more um, widely applicable intervention, perhaps I've listed here a community um, care program that arguably has far greater health benefits, but it doesn't have the attraction of a new molecule and the new cancer treatments that improve survival by you know, two weeks or something or other. Um, at the cost of £200,000. But these are the sorts of decisions that NICE have to make some, um, some guide, pro provide some guidance on. So how do we prioritise? What, on what basis do we make these judgments? Well, I'll just go through some of these points just to um, highlight the issues here. First of all, in terms of demand and what's driving demand. First of all, clearly we have an ageing population. Um, this, these are the, the population pyramid, the structure of the population in the UK. And the shaded area relates to 2016, and the, the darker line is projection to 2041. And you can see a clear increase in numbers um, in the 70-plus age category. Um, and people who, um, who get older acquire more and more diseases. This is a publication from Scottish Data, published in The Lancet a few years ago, which <laughs> presents the proportion of patients by age groupings on the x-axis um, with zero, one, two, three, upwards of eight or more concurrent um, chronic diseases. And you'll see for the average 65 to 70 year old uh, person in the population, they may have three or four different disorders. And each of those obviously would require some form of treatment. So as the population ages, they accumulate more and more chronic 
diseases, needing um, greater intervention, um, obviously resulting ultimately in, in polypharmacy. Um, this is the uh, a publication from the European Journal of Clinical Pharmacology, again, uh, four or five years ago now, which presents the um, number of medicines prescribed according to, to age, um, again, in categories of, in, in bands of 10 years on the x-axis. So you'll see for, for 20 to 29-year-olds, um, about 20% of, of, of the population would be prescribed some form of medicine, um, and of those, about half of them would just be prescribed one medicine. Um, and a few being prescribed more. Look at the other end of the spectrum, 80 and 90 plus years of age, you've got 90% of the population within that age category having um, prescription medicines, um, and the majority would have four, five, six or more um, different medicines. So these are just quantifying um, the obvious in some ways. We all know that these are problematic areas, um, but they, they illustrate how the increase in demand um, impacts on, on the health service. So how does the health service respond and what are the um, actions it could take to supply to meet the demand? Well, first of all, if we look at the expenditure, the UK expenditure on health, um, it has increased. The figure on the left here um, pre presents the, the cost in 2018-2019 figures um, in billions. So it will have increased from about 25 to 30 billion back in the late 1950s to today's values which are nearing 160 billion. And you can see that the rate of change tends to correspond with um, which party are in government. Um, and on the right hand side, the, the figure there is the uh, NHS expenditure as a percentage of GDP. Uh, so it's not just the absolute number, but the proportionate um, value has also increased from about 3% to today's value, which is about 7%. So it's more than doubling the proportion of the, um, the Treasury's um, uh, pot of money um, goes towards, obviously, towards the NHS. Um, meanwhile, spending on medicines has increased dramatically. It's not just a function of the volume of medicines, but the unit cost of medicines has increased too. Uh, back in 2010, 2011, which is not that long ago, there was £13 billion spent on medicines, um, which has increased um, a couple of years ago now to, to £17 billion. And it's a steady growth of about 5% per year cumulative. Um, and we see new treatments being you know, £20,000 per patient per year. Some of the CAR T cell therapies, you know, two, three, four hundred thousand pounds per patient. Um, treatments for cystic fibrosis, likewise, 100, 200,000 pounds per patient per year. Uh, and these are massive costs. And the difficult questions are to determine whether they represent good value for money for the NHS. These uh, figures in terms of prescribing costs, um, this is a plot just breaking it down by sector. Um, the, the reddish colour is um, hospital prescribing dispensed in the hospital pharmacy. So this is secondary care prescribing, which accounts for about 50% of all prescription drug costs. Um, and the orangey color um, is primary care prescribing. There's a darker shade in between, which is the hospital prescribing, but dispensed in the community, which is a very small proportion. So it's remained, well, the, the balance is shifting a little bit um, more towards secondary care. Um, going back to 2010, thereabouts, perhaps it was more you know, two-fifths was hospital expenditure, whereas now it's about 50% hospital expenditure in terms of proportion spent on, on medicines. Right, so that's the sort of the background and the context and why is it really important to consider um, the value of, of medicines. Um, and the, the tools that we have to quantify value and to assess value for money um, come from the discipline of economics and obviously the sub-discipline um, of health economics, but economics itself clearly is a social science um, that looks into scarcity, um, analyzes how choices are structured within and prioritized to maximize welfare within constrained resources. So, effectively, if we have inputs, which are the you know the, the resources made available from from government, and the outputs, which which is health and life expectancy and gains in survival. Um, how do we best meet those outcomes with 
the inputs available. Um, the inputs um, are scarce. We don't have infinite costs, infinite resources available to spend on healthcare. Um, and so how do we maximize the outputs given what we have in terms of um, the financing? And the, there's the, the notion of opportunity cost, which is, which is really fundamental to all this. Um, and, you know, if I were to invest a million pounds in one area, it means I no longer have that million pounds to buy health in another area. Something has to be displaced. So all these decisions that NICE make, um, approving new medicines, effectively mean that something else has been displaced or diluted in the health service. So there are some winners and losers. The winners tend to be those patients who um, are eligible for newer treatments, and the losers are those who perhaps have some form of, um, you know, they have to wait a bit longer for their surgery, or the you know, elderly patients may not get the, the home care that they perhaps used to have previously, etc. So within the, the bigger discipline of economics, obviously there's the sub-discipline of health economics, which is specific about allocation of scarce resources um, to meet our healthcare needs. Um, and within a public-funded healthcare system, such as the UK, NHS, it means providing an evidence base for decision makers to promote efficiency in terms of meeting societal goals for producing health gain and tackling inequalities in health. Um, so the fundamental basis of the technology assessment um, activities of NICE, for instance, are to try and allocate resources in the most efficient manner in order to improve population health outcomes. We'll go to the methods um, with Andrew in, 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 in slides and presentations to follow. So this just brings me back to the notion of, um, of the choices and the, the framework in making choices. Health economics considers the costs and consequences of healthcare interventions services and programs. It is different from accounting. Accounting, if you speak to the finance section of, of hospitals, they're always interested in um, how much does it cost for something or other. Um, locally, there's a great concern, finance, about the um, increase in the costs of the, the NOACs um, and how you know, it's been an exponential increase in, in, the, in expenditure. And they want to, to try and tackle that. They want to reduce um, or cap um, the expenditure on, on NOAX. And I don't realise, you know, you need to look trade that off against the potential benefits or the harms, whichever way it might be, um, with warfarin, let's say. Um, so, so from a financial and accounting perspective, they're only interested in, in the finances. From an economics perspective, we're interested in all the evidence-based medicine that you'll know about and the, the outputs of clinical trials and estimates of clinical effectiveness but we incorporate also the notion of costs and how one tr is traded off against the other. So for, for instance, um, it might cost me some certain number of pounds um, to use intervention A in a given population P, a given population P, um, and as a consequence of using A, I will either gain or lose some amount of, of health outcome, um, but as a consequence of using A, I will also uh, lose or save some amount of of funding, which is an economic outcome. And the, the methods that we use for cost-effectiveness analysis um, is looking explicitly at both the health outcomes as well as the, the costs of <coughs> achieving those outcomes. And the set of tools that we do have, are called the economic evaluation, um, provides an explicit framework for identifying and comparing costs and benefits of different options. And again, returning to this notion of an opportunity cost, uh, which is fundamental to, to everything that we do, um, the, it's the value of the benefits foregone by not using health resources in the best alternative use. Um, there's always an opportunity cost to every decision that we make. My opportunity cost of coming up to Edinburgh this weekend is I've missed out with my family back home over the weekend. You know, I thought that on balance that was fine. Happy to forego <laughs> being with my family over the weekend, but it, that's the opportunity cost. And similarly, you know, if Nice depend, decided to fund. Vertex's latest cystic fibrosis drug at some undisclosed cost. That might well be a politically good thing. It might be, um, you know, a good thing for patients. But but the, there's a big trade-off. Those hundreds of millions of pounds are no longer available for other services, um, arguably for the same population group in other ways. There are different methods of economic evaluation, and we'll go through these over the course of the morning. 
Um, the most simple method is the cost minimization analysis. And this requires evidence of therapeutic equivalence. And the easiest example to think about is branded against generic drugs, um, therapeutically equivalent in, in most instances. Um, and so you would clearly go for the least cost option, um, which is why obviously generic prescribing is at the rates that it is in this country. Compare that with the states, um, it's all still very much um, prescribed by brand name and, and the, you know, the cost which is attached to that. It does have a limitation in that you know, it's quite rare that you have two interventions which are identical in terms of health outcomes. And so we do need to look at other methods and the, the cost effectiveness analysis is an alternative whereby we can compare two things which differ in terms of costs, but also differ in terms of the benefits that they achieve. Uh, but they have to be measured, those benefits need to be measured on the same scale. So if you have two treatments that extend your life, um, so improve survival, um, then you can compare how much does it cost for an additional month of survival. And that would give you some idea of the cost effectiveness of those interventions. But not all interventions improve survival, clearly. Um, you know, there's a mix of improving of, of your, your symptoms, your quality of life improvement, um, and obviously in some cases the, they do extend your life expectancy or prevent um, premature death. And so the favoured approach is the cost utility analysis, um, where utility refers to um, a preference based outcome that considers both um, time and um, quality of life. And so that can capture um, quality, well, it, it's, it, the, the measure is the quality adjusted life year, the quality, and it's the, the function, um, it's the product of of a quality of life for a given period of time by that amount of time. So it can take into consideration both survival and quality of life outcomes. And arguably, um, from a patient perspective, all that they are really interested in, what matters is how well they feel and how long will they um, survive or how long they will live for. So if you've captured those two dimensions adequately, uh, then the suggestion is that the quality can be used to make comparisons across different disease areas and across treatments. And it's the it's preferred metric by which NICE uh, makes its decisions on cost effectiveness. Just for completeness, there is a fourth method, which is the cost benefit analysis, um, that, which is rarely used in healthcare because it requires um, uh, an, the analyst to assign monetary valuation to health outcomes. Um, and that's quite challenging methodologically. So we see that quite often in other aspects of economics, um, maybe in a, in a transport sector, they use it extensively to trade off building HS2 versus, you know, what are the benefits of HS2 versus what are the costs? Um, and they quantify both financially and come up with a cost benefit analysis. Um, but I won't go into that in any more detail because it's not really used in, in healthcare. I think that was my final slide. Um, so I'll hand over to Andrew unless there are some immediate questions. There'll be plenty of opportunities for questions and discussions at the end of the session. Okay, over to you, Andrew. Right, okay, thank you. Um, so I'm Andrew Hitchings. I'm uh, a senior lecturer in clinical pharmacology at St. George's. Um, I'm gonna, I'll am going start just by way of a little bit of preamble to, to give a, a bit of a disclaimer um, in that Diffrig and I are at opposite ends of the expertise spectrum here. Um, in that I was not, uh, as Emma says, not, not uh, long ago in your shoes. Um, but in the intervening period, I've joined a NICE technology appraisal committee. And I have come to realize that there was this massive void in my knowledge about a topic that is really important for us as clinical pharmacologists to understand. Um, so I'm not going to claim expertise on the subject, but I am going to uh, claims some degree of empathy or understanding with what I think that us as clinical pharmacologists should understand about the topic. Um, but uh, please do ask difficult and challenging questions, but I might then lean on different to uh, <laughs> answer them. Okay, so we've just had a great introduction to what health economics is and the types of um, uh, economic evaluation. I'm gonna break it down a little bit into its constituent parts. Um, or particularly focusing on cost effectiveness, cost utility analysis. So the constituent parts of, cost of, of those uh, forms of evaluation, as the name implies, you need to have some measure of 
utility or effectiveness, um, in other words, measuring health. And then, of course, you need to have some measure of costs. Uh, and so I'm going to go through the, the, the two of those in turn, how they are captured and how that information is then put together, how it's synthesized into cost utility analysis outputs that are then used as the basis for making decisions. Um, and we're going to, over the course of the morning, we're going to work through, firstly, the sort of mechanics of cost utility analysis. We'll get you to do an exercise so you can rehearse the process of it. Um, we're going to, later on in the morning, we'll go through some of the really important economic uh, components of it, which is particularly includes modelling, uh, and we'll get you to do a little bit of modelling as well. And then we'll finish off with a uh, session on um, making decisions. So let's start firstly with the concept of uh, cost utility analysis. I'm sure you will have seen um, graphics like this before that put cost effectiveness onto a kind of two-dimensional plane um, with cost represented on the y-axis and effectiveness on the x-axis. And that allows you to divide um, uh, new technologies according to how effective they are compared to some comparator, usually the existing technology, and how costly they are compared to the, the uh, current treatment or existing technology. Let's start by focusing just on effectiveness. <coughs> so as we've heard from Diffrig, um, cost utility analysis, which is the preferred form of economic evaluation for most technology appraisals, um, is usually based on this metric of the quality adjusted life year. And I'm sure you've heard about, the, heard about qualities, you know what qualities are, but maybe we just need to think about why qualities need to be used in this form of uh, evaluation. They provide an exchangeable currency to measure health outcomes. Why do we need an exchangeable currency? Well, let's think about the kind of evaluations that might be done by a health technology appraisal body. This was one that was done early in the... Um, the history of NICE, um, a, an early appraisal of growth hormone to improve height in children. One that's been done recently and to an extent is still ongoing is Arenamab uh, to treat uh, migraines, to particularly to reduce migraine frequency. So here's something that demonstrably, from a clinical effectiveness point of view, has a health benefit in that it reduces your frequency of migraine and therefore improves your quality of life, but I'm sure you'll anticipate that by and large it doesn't have any life extending effect. Compare that to something like, and I've just picked a one of many examples uh, that I could have done from this year, osimertinib to improve outcome in non-small cell lung cancer, where in this case outcome um, was to a large extent uh, um, a product of an extension to life. So we've got three <coughs> technologies here that are producing benefits on completely different scales. One improving stature, one improving quality of life, and one extending life. How can you possibly compare one against the other when the outcome is being measured on a completely different scale? How can you equate a certain height gain to a certain life extension or so a certain reduction in migraine frequency? And that's where the quality comes in. And as we've heard, it's the product of length of life and quality of life. So if we were to visualize that um, over the course of a, a period of time, if we put uh, time on the x-axis and quality of life on the y-axis, we say we've got some treatment for some condition that gives you a certain quality of life for a period of time, and then maybe something happens, maybe your disease progresses or you suffer a complication or something and your quality drops off, but you continue living for a period longer and then ultimately you die. And that's the treatment that we're looking at and we're comparing it with some existing <coughs> treatment that uh, gives you a life course that looks something like that. And I've um, uh, just, just slightly offset it only just so that you can see one against the other. But let's imagine that for all intents and purposes, quality of life in the two states is the same, but the old treatment doesn't lead you to live as long after disease progression as the new treatment. So you've got a benefit here, you've got a net gain in that uh, life has been extended, but it's not been extended at a time that you were in the best quality of life. So the 
difference between the two uh, is capturing the quality of life as well as the degree to which it has been extended. Likewise, let's consider an alternative where you've got two treatments, neither of which, or what the new treatment doesn't extend your life, but it does improve your quality. So yellow treatment gives you better quality than blue treatment, um, and that is also captured in the quality gain as a net, net difference. Um, so how do we then capture the qualities? Well, life year, year is relatively, relatively simple to measure, at least within the context of the data that you've got. We'll come on to um, uh, the, the difficulties of how you extend beyond the data, but in, in, a, in a simple sense, you can count how long life is. Uh, the one that's a bit more tricky to measure is quality of life. And for the purpose of the quality, uh, quality of life is measured on a scale that has two anchor points, uh, one which represents perfect health, and zero which represents the state of being dead. And so that would naturally imply that anything in between zero and one represents some degree of impaired health, imperfect health. You'll notice here, though, that I've not put zero at the origin of this uh, graph. And that, of course, is to account for the possibility that there may be states worse than death. And that is accounted for in the calculation of the quality. General, the acute take, for example. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> we could all think of many examples, I'm sure. <laughs> Okay, so, so that's, that's the scale that we're measuring on, but we've got to populate that scale with some numbers. So we need some measure of what quality of life is. Um, how do you get that value? Well, um, I'm, I'm a bit nice centric just because uh, uh, that's the, the thing that I've got a bit of experience with. Um, I think it is broadly representative <laughs> of how um, many other appraisal bodies would, would work. But I will present basically the methods guide, how it works for the instruments. So the, the preferred instrument used by NICE is the EQ5D, which sta EQ stands for Euroqual, which is the uh, group that constructed this. And 5D stands for five dimensions because it uh, measures your, or asks the patient to rate their health and quality of health related quality of life on five um, dimensions, which we'll come to in a second. So we need to ask the patients, by and large, I guess occasionally it could be a proxy. So in children, for example, sometimes there might be, uh, it might be that you ask a parent, although we can debate whether that's the right thing or not. Um, but by and large, the patient rates their own health state in terms of how they are experiencing their illness and their life. So they might say, these are the five dimensions, uh, they might say, I've got some problems walking around, some problems walking, uh, washing and dressing, some problems performing my usual activities. I've got moderate pain, but I don't feel anxious or depressed. So those are the five dimensions on which they will rate themselves. And just as a little side note, in the, uh, the version of EQ5D that is uh, currently mostly used, at least by NICE, it has three levels. So they have to categorize their, um, or distill their health state into essentially no problems, some problems, or major problems. They only have three levels. There is a five-level version that um, uh, is, is, uh, not, has not, for technical reasons, been fully adopted yet. But, um, so we use the EQ5D3L version. So they, they measure, they rate their, uh, their, their health state or their health-related quality of life. But then the interesting thing is here, or at least came as an interesting point to me as someone coming into this field new is that they then don't put a value on their health state. It is then put to the population to value their health state on that scale that I've described where you've got zero and one as anchor points. So um, let me ask you to have a go. If you, uh, if you can get on, uh, get some internet access either um, on Wi-Fi or, or 4G or whatever, you can scan the QR code or you can uh, go to menti.com and then enter the code, which is 580113. And I hope that people will start to give me nods to indicate that you can see some question that's asking you to rate your health state. Excellent. Now, for this one, I'm presuming that we consider this health state to be better than dead. 
Um, so I'm not giving the option to rate it as a negative number. So when you've done that, you can press submit and we'll see how we do. So interestingly, I need to, I think, Okay, so that's uh, got the majority of the audience there, 36 people. So you're giving a mean value of, out of a scale of 10, 6.1. So let's say 0.61 on our quality scale. How do you compare to... Um... So, interestingly, surprisingly, uh, I say not surprisingly, because I've done this in other places. It actually, it's interesting that... Um, it often comes out around about the same value that you get from the UK value set that would be used in uh, nice appraisals of 0.587 in this case. Um, so there I gave you simply a scale and you had to just basically draw a line somewhere on that scale. So you might say well, that's, that's kind of like doing a sort of visual analog scale and that would be one way of acquiring a value for a health state. Um, but it's not, the, it's not generally the preferred way, and certainly from NICE's point of view, it's not the preferred way. NICE prefers a method to generate uh, utility values that are based on making a choice between two options and kind of iterating the choices available until you reach a point of indifference. Um, and, th and that allows you to settle upon a value for the, um, uh, for the health state. And the, the particular method that NICE prefers or at least is used to, to generate the value set that's used in nice appraisals is the time trade-off method. So I'd like to go through what you do uh, to gain values by my time trade-off method. So the way this works is, uh, crudely, is that it puts to a person, uh, a member of the population who's involved in the, in the study, it says, well, this is envisaged that your life is going to comprise 10 years as of now uh, in some impaired health state, the state that we are describing to you. Um, so that's, that's, what, that's the life that you're going to live. <coughs> but you have an alternative. You have another option. You could choose, if you prefer, a different life in which you have full health, but it has to be for a shorter period of time. So you have to trade off some length of life in order to get full health. So... Let's imagine that we, for a, a start of a 10, we say we've got the health state we've described or we've got an alternative life where you, it lives, you live half as long, five years in this case, but in that uh, five years you will have um, full health. So if I was to move this along, how would you describe those two health states? Or rather, which would you choose? If you now go to menti.com again, you should just, it should just uh, move on automatically. You should find that um, you can now choose between life A and life B. I'll wait just for a moment until I see most people here. So, I'm afraid it is so slightly tediously, I have to uh, stop the presentation to go to. Okay, so you're telling me that as it stands, by and large, you think that five years, that's too much to trade off. You'd prefer to live your 10 years, but with the impaired health. So I'll say, okay, well, let me change it then. Um, let's say. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So you, this is the uh, uh, this is the health state that was described on your on your screen. So um, we gave I gave you the option of um, of, of ten years like this or five years uh, in perfect health. Um, sorry. I think I think it may be the case. Oh yes, that's, that's right. So if you now look at your um, at Menti. 
uh, on, in front of you. You should see that it now gives you, I've taken it that you thought five years was too much to trade off. Um, and so I'm giving you an alternative option of trading off seven years, or rather trading off three years and having seven years of perfect health. The you don't know what the, you don't know what the pain is. Right? It's just moderate pain. Okay. You're, for those of you who are still saying you'd prefer to live 10 years with moderate pain, let's just go up a little bit more. Let's say you can have eight years of perfect health versus 10 years of impaired pain, uh, of pain. And you then, and you go to the point until you reach uh, a point of indifference. And the point of indifference um, gives you then uh, the utility value, which in this case is, uh, for the UK population, is about 0.8. So essentially what it's saying is that most people would value eight years of perfect health to be equivalent to 10 years in moderate pain. Let's um, consider another. So if I just move that on. Uh, okay, right. Okay, so hopefully now you should have the correct choice in front of you. See what you're saying. <laughs> All right, so I, I won't bother showing you. Um, I can tell you that overwhelmingly, you'd prefer five years of perfect health. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, let's go down to three years. Still prefer three years of perfect health to this state? Okay, again, so most people have now voted, and I can tell you that what we've got so far is 28, oh no, actually, no, it's all coming in now, so 31 out of 34 people still prefer three years, and three people think that it's about the same. Okay, I'm gonna go down to one year now. Would you prefer one year in perfect health or <coughs> 10 years in this state? Okay, again, so in the interest of not uh, messing up the presentation, I shall tell you what results we've got. So we've got 36 people have voted so far. Uh, still, the preference overwhelmingly is for one year of perfect health, with 22 people voting for that. Uh, eight people would go for 10 years of perfect health, and seven people would say they're about the same. So still, we've got the majority of people preferring um, one year of perfect health. So let's give it, we seem to keep iterating and we're not reaching a point of indifference for most of you yet. So let me put another option to you. You could have the option of immediate painless death. Um, your, your life will simply stop at this point. And I'm asking you now to choose between whether you would live, prefer to live for 10 years in this state or for your life to just come to an end at this point. Hmm? <laughs> right. Okay, I'll show you. I'll show you the answers now. Uh... 
Okay, so just, just so you can see how you're voting. Um, so still, so actually now more of a spread, um, <coughs> but we've got now um, still the majority of you, or the largest group of you rather, I should say, are now are preferring that they just like their, like their death, uh, like their life to simply come to an end at this point. So how do we deal with that? Um, we've got a state that you're essentially saying is worse than death. So you could assign a value of zero for that. But the problem then comes is there will be different states that are worse than death. And if all of those states are valued at zero, it gives you no means to distinguish between them. So if you had a treatment that came along that improved your health within a state that you consider to be worse than death, that would still be valued at zero because you've bottomed out on your scale. So we need some means of uh, separating out these uh, states that are worse than death. And um, the uh, way that this would be done is, sorry, if I just show you this, is that we now, we've reached, we've uh, established that you would, pref you, given the choice between your life just coming to an end and the state we've described, you would prefer your life to come to an end, that those of you who have um, uh, voted for that. So now we say, well, here's one option, which is that your life just comes to an end. Here's an alternative option, which is that to compensate you for that period of impaired health, we're going to reward you with three years at the end of perfect health. So now your life is going to be seven years in the state that's been described and three years in perfect health. And what will then be done is that will be iterated to understand how much life in perfect health you would need to counterbalance the period in imperfect health. And the proportion, the relative proportion of the two then allows you to assign a utility value to that state that's worse than death. And I'll just uh, um, skip to the answer here is that crudely the UK population would like to have at least like to have three and a half years of perfect health to compensate for the other six and a half years of imperfect health, giving you a utility value of minus three point uh, minus point three three. Any questions on that? You still die at the end. <laughs> yeah. So your life is still ten years long, and you die at the end. Yeah. Yeah, so it is a sample, it's supposed to be a representative sample of the adult non-institutionalized population. So it can include people with some impairment of health, um, but it's supposed to be a broadly representative sample of the UK population. Yeah. Um, does it take into account the age you are when you sort of have to, I, mean, I think my answer would be quite different if you said that this affects you now as opposed to when I'm a citizen. Yeah. So yeah, I don't believe so. So I think that the if, uh, different will be able to answer this better than me. Sorry, and I should just repeat the questions, which is, as you, uh, is that the the age that you are asked to consider this scenario clearly uh, the amount of life you're expecting to have left may um, determine your choice. I I would imagine I think that the scenarios are presented in a standard way to all the participants in the study. So hopefully by having a spread of people across all the age groups, you get a common view. Yeah. Yes. So the question is, are there differences between different demographics and, and cultural groups and things? Yes, absolutely there are. Again, within the UK population, the idea is that you have a, a representative sample. But one interesting thing is that there are value sets for the various states in the EQ5D for each, for a whole load of territories. And, one, and you can access these and you can look at them. And it's quite interesting to compare how different territories uh, value different health states. They can be quite different. Are these values available for other countries? Yeah, that, that's what I mean, is that there are, there are uh, value sets for <coughs> other countries, and, the, and those uh, value sets may be different from the, the value sets for the UK population. Obviously, there might be methodological differences in how they were acquired, but um, there are also probably differences in the way that um, 
collectively we, we value help. <coughs> yeah. Uh, that's right. And again, so the question is just emphasizing the cultural groups' differences. And yes, there would undoubtedly be differences for many reasons, not just cultural reasons. And the idea in the studies is that you have a large enough representative sample to capture the broad spread of opinion. Let me um, move on. Is anyone sliced up by country, as in Scotland or Ireland? So, um, so the, the, the value set that is it sliced up by country is the question. Um, uh, and the value set that I think is used for, that is used for NICE is a UK value set, I think. I think it's for the whole of the UK, although technically NICE makes decisions for um, NHS England, um, but it's a UK UK sample. I, I don't, I'm not aware of whether Scotland values uh, health and quality of life differently to um, to England. Let me move on then to from effectiveness to cost. Um, so you would think that cost should be relatively straightforward to measure. It's just um, counting is what you might, uh, I might naively have said. But of course, actually, when you start to think about it more deeply, there are many things that um, fundamentally affect the cost of some new, delivering some new technology. One thing would be whose costs are you measuring? So um, obviously, there will be the cost of buying the drug. Um, and then there will be the cost of administering the drug. And we will go through that in the exercise in a moment. And uh, part of the reason for the exercise is that I just wanted to introduce you to the <coughs> concept of where these values are, cost uh, values are obtained from. And there's this thing called health resource groups that attempts to distill common activities into certain codes that can then be priced for the purposes of uh, health technology evaluations. So there'll be the cost of getting the drug, the cost of delivering it, um, maybe there'll be the cost of dealing with some complications for a proportion of people. Um, so you can start to capture those. But then, well, what about the patient? The patient has <coughs> to get to hospital. Um, so they might need to pay for parking. Um, or their uh, um, other half might have to pay for petrol to get them there. So there's some costs to the person. Um, but... Maybe they also have to take a day off work. And if they have to take a day off work, then their employer has to maybe employ someone to do their job for them on that day. So there'll be a cost to the employer. But maybe they don't get someone. If it was medicine, if it was healthcare, they wouldn't employ anyone to do our job, would they? So it just wouldn't happen. Everyone else would soak up the work. Um, so then the team is less efficient. So there's a sort of productivity cost. So maybe there's a cost to the whole economy, actually, um, uh, from the person having to take it off. So where you draw the lines um, has a fundamental effect on what the costs are. And uh, that is summarized in this term of perspective. And NICE, at least, takes the view that the perspective when measuring costs should be that of the costs to the health service and personal <coughs> social services. Um, so it doesn't account for costs to the wider economy or costs to the patient and, and so on. Next thing is um, costs over what length of time. If you've got a treatment that is being given for many years and has a recurring annual cost, then clearly the cost of treatment over one year is going to be uh, much less than the cost of treatment over 10 years. Over what length of time do you measure the cost? And that's um, described as the, or captured by this term of time horizon. Um, and again, to put to you the nice view, it is that the time horizon should be long enough to capture all of the costs of treatment and indeed all of the health related quality of life um, or, or utility uh, benefits of treatment and yeah. often for a chronic disease the time horizon will be the rest of the person's life a lifetime time horizon which you will immediately appreciate raises a potential problem here because uh, most clinical trials do not extend for the duration of someone's life and you're lucky if you have a couple of years um, and so how do you deal with the uh, period that extends beyond the trial data? This necessitates modeling, which becomes a crucial part of economic evaluations. And then thirdly, discounting. When do we want to experience things, um, be they costs or health benefits? 
um, you will I'm sure easily appreciate that if I was to say, I'm going to present to you with an invoice for attending today of £100, and you can have the option of paying it today or in 10 years' time, you'd probably prefer to pay for it in 10 years' time for various reasons, not least of which is inflation. But in 10 years' time, £100 is going to be worth a lot less than it is now. So there needs to be some discounting of costs over time. And that's done at a rate that is set by the Treasury of 3.5% per annum. So a cost in one year's time of £1,035 will be valued at £1,000 today. But of course, over time, that would then create an imbalance between the benefits that you're observing and the costs that you're ascribing to treatment. Um, and so benefits also need to be discounted. Benefits in a health sense need to be discounted. So your quality gain will also be discounted at a rate of 3.5% per annum. So quality gain experienced in 10 years' time will be valued differently to a quality gain experienced now. So there are some uh, <coughs> fundamental points that, uh, that can have a, a significant effect on what the costs are. It's more complicated than it might, appreciate, might appear uh, to those of us uh, looking at it naively. Okay, so we've considered cost and effective list. Now we need to put them together into some um, uh, integrated measure of cost effectiveness or cost utility. Let's consider that we've got an existing treatment, which I'll call A, and a new treatment, which I'll call B. And uh, the common scenario is that the new treatment will be more effective but more costly than the existing treatment. Um, but, uh, and, and then I should say that then, of course, you can, we've got a, now a measure of the uh, benefit of the new treatment in terms of the quality gain, and we've got a measure of the cost of the new treatment in terms of the incremental cost. So these are measured relative to the existing treatment. And if we take the ratio of the two, or the gradient of this line, we get an incremental cost effectiveness ratio, which is measured in a value of pounds per quality. Um, and this you will have come across, I'm sure, in uh, reading nice technology appraisals and other uh, technology appraisals. Um, now, there will be some uh, decisions or some um, cost effectiveness uh, cases that will be, in a sense, no-brainers. There will be um, new treatments that come along very uh, rarely that are more effective but less costly than the existing treatment. And it would seem obvious that we should adopt those treatments. And I just want to use this, although it's an unusual uh, situation, just to introduce you some terminology in case you're reading uh, technology appraisals. Where you come across this word dominates, um, this is what it means. So treatment B is more effective and less costly than treatment A. So B is said to dominate A. And just putting it the other way around, if it was the other way around, if new treatment was less effective and more costly, so you're paying more but getting less, then B is said to be dominated by A. So where you see that sort of table of ISAs and it will sometimes say dominated or dominates, <coughs> Uh, that's what it refers to, where something is more effective um, and less costly, or vice versa. But then the usual scenario, more common scenario, will be this one, as I say, where you've got a new treatment that's more effective, but um, also more costly. And that, in this scenario, you need to draw a line somewhere. And the line is effectively drawn by your cost-effectiveness threshold, which is also expressed in a value of pounds per quality, and therefore is also effectively a, a, a gradient um, on, on this uh, graph. So treatments that fall under the line will be said, on the basis of this a cost of effectiveness threshold, they will be said to be cost effective, whereas a treatment that falls above the line will be not cost effective in a crude sense. Um, but things can become more complicated than this because it may be that there's not just two treatments available in the pathway. There might be another treatment available, treatment C. And you'll notice that treatment C is also more effective, but more costly than the existing treatment A. Both of them fall below the line. So both of them are cost effective when measured against treatment A. But treatment B is more cost effective than treatment A. So if you were making decisions purely on the basis of your cost effectiveness threshold, there would be, and 
as we've heard already, this is not about affordability. This is not about uh, the total amount that you'll be pre you're prepared to pay. It's about getting the most from your money. If you want to get the most from your money, then there would be no scenario under which you would accept treatment B, but not accept treatment <coughs> C, because treatment C is more cost effective than treatment B. It's more costly as well, but it's also more cost effective. And where that scenario arises, <coughs> B is said to be extendedly dominated by C. So this is, this is the concept of extended dominance. So, uh, and, and this is important, although it seems a little bit technical, it's important in cost effectiveness analysis, as we'll come to in a second in the uh, exercise. Um, where you are considering all the treatments available within uh, the treatment pathway. So B effectively becomes redundant because, uh, because C exists. On its own, it would be considered cost effectiveness, but because of the availability of a more cost effective option, it is uh, extendedly dominated and therefore uh, becomes redundant effectively. Okay, so let me just summarize what we've talked about. We've gone through how we measure, how health is measured in terms of the length of life, which is relatively straightforward, uh, and the quality of life. And I've talked particularly about how a value is ascribed to quality of life using the time trade-off method. Uh, then uh, how costs are measured in terms of uh, some of the key factors that need to be determined when you're uh, in advance, when you're setting up the um, cost effectiveness analysis. Uh, which are perspective, time horizon, and discounting, and many others. And then we've gone through the incremental cost effectiveness ratios, which, as I say, expressed in terms of cost per quality, um, measured against a cost effectiveness thre threshold. And then I've just introduced you to these terms of dominance and also this slightly peculiar term of extended dominance, which are um, important when it comes to actually doing health uh, uh, technology appraisals. Any questions on that, uh, that topic? 